It's a great pleasure to welcome to our 2021 Online Trend Summit, Dr. Giles Yeo, MBE, Principal Research Associate at MRC University of Cambridge. Um, you're also a documentary maker, author of two fantastic books. Welcome, Giles. It's a great pleasure to have you speak on our virtual stage this year. No, thank you so much for having me at the Food People's Annual Trends at Summit. I mean, that sounds just really exciting to be here. So there we go. <laughs> It's great to have you here. I mean, on the back of a global pandemic, our health and well-being couldn't be more in focus than it is currently, which makes your special interests of obesity, brain control over body weight and genetic influences on appetite behaviour particularly interesting um, to us all right now. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to hand you the virtual stage to talk about a number of topics around, you know, why do we have an obesity epidemic in the UK? Key takeouts from your book, um, why calories don't count, some of the truths about diets, why from a calorific point of view, protein and fiber are so important, but really importantly, I think for industry, how we can use calorie information in a more sophisticated way on pack and how we, you know, how can we communicate this better? There's a whole conversation growing around ultra processed foods. What are the issues around ultra processed foods? And ultimately how as an industry, we can leverage the findings from your work to perhaps create better ultra processed foods. Just a note to um, listeners as Trend Hub subscribers, you can find out more about the topics that we're going to be covering in this discussion within our 2223 trends framework under the mega trends um, your best self preemptive health and on target within the trends framework on trend hub so without further ado and after those intros Giles I'm going to hand you the floor so over to you um thank you so much um Charles so uh like Charles says my name is Giles Yo I'm based at the University of Cambridge where I study um, actually, I'm a geneticist by trade, and I study the genetics of body weight. Um, but we now understand that studying the genetics of body weight is, by its very definition, studying the genetics of how our brain influences um, food intake. I'll, I'll talk about that just, just briefly here. Um, so that's what I study. I study the biological variation, why people are small, medium, and large mm -hmm. um, in, the, in, the, in the environment we're living in. And actually, the reality is how our genes influence our food intake. But we, we cannot study and understand the obesity crisis epidemic um, without understanding the yin to the yang, the other side, which is the food environment that we actually live in, okay? The diets we're facing, uh, the kind of food we buy, and the kind of information that's provided actually and, and at the back of the pack. And given that whom I'm speaking to today, I wanted to focus today on the latter, the latter half. And in particular, I wanted to consider the calorie. This is this is almost my meditation on the calorie. It is the topic of um of my most recent book, Why Calories Don't Count. And so largely, I want to really bring up some ideas that I bring up that I talk about in a book and and speak about this um to, to, to you guys today about why calories um, um don't count. Now, I look. I maybe this is the wrong slide to show you guys because you know what the regulations are. Um, but I've just showed up. You know, obviously the left hand side is UK EU compliant labeling. Um, back and front of pack. Um, the right hand side is FDA compliant, um, US FDA compliant labeling. And I've kind of highlighted the calories, which is what we're going to be talking about here. And obviously, what we have is different nomenclature. We have in the UK EU side, KJ, KCAL. And then from the United States side, we have calories, but spelled with a capital C. And this is going to be relevant in, in, in three seconds. So I think just so that we understand where we're coming from in this particular presentation, I'm going to go through some nomenclature, okay? And also, so you understand what I'm talking about when I refer to the word calorie. So first of all, what is a calorie? So let's go back to, to almost, this, this is a history study, okay? Let's deal with the calorie as a form, as a unit of heat, which was what it was originally designed to do. And the heat calorie aka the small c calorie, all right, is the amount of energy it takes to raise one milliliter of water one degree Celsius at sea level. But that's not the kind of calories that all of us within the industry, uh, well, within the industry, within the, within the biological uh, control of body weight industry and the food industry talk about. We talk about the food calorie, the big c calorie, which is 1000 small c calories. Hence, so it's the amount of energy that takes to raise one liter of water one degree Celsius at sea level. Hence, a big C calorie, which is what the Americans call it, is also called a kilocalorie or a kcal. And this is the food calorie. And the entire talk 
and the rest of this, this presentation, when I say calorie, this is the calorie I'm actually talking to you guys about. But then there's one other um, um, figure there, right? One other unit, the KJ. Well, that is the SI unit. So one small C calorie is 4.2 joules. Now joules is the SI unit for, for, for energy. And so therefore, because a big C calorie is a thousand small C calories, one kilocalorie, one big C calorie is 4.2 kilojoules or kj. Clear as mud. There we go. Okay. So this is what we're going to be, what, what are we talking about? So let's get to the meat of things. Why don't I think calories count? Clearly they count to some degree. I mean, I understand obviously that 200 calories of chips is going to be twice the portion of 100 calories of chips. Of course it is. But so is 200 grams of chips twice the portion of 100 grams of chips. Yet, would we be sitting around trying to compare 200 grams of chips to 200 grams of carrots? No, right? Because they're different densities, they're, different, they're made of different materials, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the analogy is not quite so extreme when we're talking about calories, but the analogy is there. And the reason why I think calories don't count is because A, the number of calories actually in food does not equal the number of calories on the side of the pack that you guys put on your food packaging, which does not equal the total number of usable calories we finally get out, get out of, of, of food. And this is the concept of caloric availability. Okay, So what is caloric availability? So let's just take the simplest example of food that I can think of, sugar or sucrose, okay, which, is, which is a glucose and fructose stuck together. So if you actually had 100 calories of sugar, I would say, I, I don't say I'm telling you, that the caloric availability of sugar is roughly speaking 98%, which means that for every, nine, for every 100 calories of sugar you eat, you are going to extract 98 calories out of energy that is usable. So that's what I mean by 98% available. So let's take an extreme example now of something which is calorically unavailable, sweet corn. Okay, corn on a cob. Now you know you right. You eat the you eat the corn on a cob. Say 100 calories, and then the next day you look in the loo. It is quite obvious you have absorbed nowhere close to the 100 calories of sweet corn. However, yet when you take exactly the same food source, you desiccate it, you pound it into a corn meal, you make a corn tortilla, you make cornbread, whatever it is. Okay, suddenly a far greater percentage of the calories is available to the human body. And this is with exactly the same starting material of food, all right? The difference is in the level of what you've done with the food, how you've processed the food um, um, for, for that, okay? So this is the concept of caloric availability. And part of the reason why I'm arguing that actually calories make very little sense without understanding where the food comes from, without understanding what we've actually done to the food. So I think it's useful to consider how our calories empirically measured, okay? So it is still done today, okay, exactly in this way. We have these uh, um, pieces of kit actually in, in, in our labs and it's called bomb calorimetry. So bomb calorimetry is the way we actually, is in effect a bonfire, you burn food. So you take food and you desiccate the food. The reason why you desiccate it, you dry it, it's because H2O, water, has no calorie value to human beings. If you were a nuclear power reactor, H2O would, H2O would have a, a value, but we're not, okay? And so what you do is you put this desiccated food into, into the eponymous bomb, which is a sealed container, and then you carbonize it. You actually burn it. Around this bomb is a water jacket, a water bath of known volume. And literally, you stick a thermometer in, you burn the food, and you, you, you measure, well, what temperature rise do you actually get in the water? And that is the calorie content of the food. All right. It's that simple. This is 200 year old technology. Yes, the equipment is slightly looks a bit more sophisticated. The computers attached, but the actual principle is exactly that. So are all calories equal? Well, they are once they are a unit of energy in us as a little poof of energy. OK, that we can actually use. But until that point, we have to fight our way in um, 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 to the food to actually take it out. And we are not bomb calorimeters. We are not bonfires. And that is the crucial point um, 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 that, I, that, that I'm trying to hammer home. So, okay, that based on that equation I gave you, that's A, right? That is the number of calories actually in food. But how did we get to B? 
the number of calories on the side of the pack, the number of calories you actually use at the moment. Okay, so this, for this, the person responsible is a chap named Atwater, Wilbur Olin Atwater, um, who was a, a professor of chemistry at Wesleyan University in Connecticut in the United States between 1880 and 1900. So this is, this is old, okay, more than 120 years old. And what Atwater realized was the sweet corn phenomenon, the sweet corn caloric availability phenomenon. And so he was always interested in, well, how much energy do we absorb from food? And so between 1880 and 1900, and ladies and gentlemen, I want you to keep the story in your head next time you feel like complaining about your job, okay? So what he did between 1880 and 1900 was he put numerous types of food, all kinds of foods, into, bomb calo into a bomb calorimeter, you know, celery, banana, steak, whatever, and tried to figure out the total amount of calories in the food, the heats of combustion that's actually give, given off, all right? Then... He fed these foods to human beings and then burnt their poop. No, I am not making this up. For 20 years, this is, what he, this is what he did. And in effect, what he was trying to do was, well, if you know the total calorie content that went in this way, and you know what comes out the other way, then you know what we absorbed, simplistically put. And from there, he worked out what each of the macronutrients, fat, carbs, and protein, what, how much was absorbed by, by the human being, and came up with the so-called Atwater general factors. And this is the famous numbers, nine calories for every gram of fat, four calories for every gram of carbs, and four calories for every gram of protein. So these numbers, okay, were published about 1906, I think something like that, about it's 120 years ago, all right? These are the numbers that, that, that he published. Every single calorie count on every item of food that you guys make and manufacture and stamp have been uh, in effect come from these at water factors. Now there is wobble and there's wobble for a number of different complex reasons I shan't go into in detail, but primarily due to the way people calculate how much protein there is in food. So this is, this is the, the biggest wobble factor when you go, but largely speaking, plus or minus a few percentage points, 944 at water factors are the way we estimate the amount of calories that actually are in food today. Okay, so that's how we get to be. But you know that because you guys make food. The question to ask and the critical point and my crux, the crux of my argument is how we get to see. And why is it that we don't get all these usable, all these calories that are usable um, um, out? Well, the reason behind this is because while Atwater did a very good job at how much food uh, we were able to digest and absorb, he could never take, never take into account the energy required to metabolize that food. I'm going to come and explain that uh, in, in, in a second. And it is this error. And for depending on what we're talking about, the error is actually surprisingly large, okay? That, which is why I think calories um, um, don't, don't actually count. And in particular, the crucial components that influence this element of the caloric availability of food is the protein content and or the fiber content of the food, depending on what food we're talking about. So let's deal with these one at a time, if I may. Let's deal with protein. So we know, we certainly we within the food intake field understand and know the satiating effects of protein. We know that a calorie of protein is, makes you feel fuller than a calorie of fat, than a calorie of carb, in that order. Okay, the question is why? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason has to do with understanding uh, what I call our food to poop tube, our gastrointestinal tract. Now, in order to convert food into energy, there are two main stages. And the first stage has to do with digestion. Now digestion, we understand, we've learned this, can be mechanical, that's the chewing, and then there's the washing machine sound, peristalsis in our stomach, okay, that, that actually happens. But that actually is a minor part of digestion. We kind of break it down into smaller pieces. Digestion is actually, in effect, a very long chemical reaction, 24 hours almost, where you eat it, enzymes and all the azes and everything attacks the, 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 the food, breaking it down into its constituent parts until the stuff that, that's not digested comes out the other side. And the first concept I want you guys to, to, to take home, and this is going to be true, is that food that takes longer to digest will travel further down the gut. And because of that gives off different hormones, okay? And because of the diff these different hormones that are given off, they make you feel fuller. 
Okay, and this is going to be true for any number of things, including foods that are high, particularly foods that are high in protein and foods that are high in fiber. Okay, and so that is one reason why protein is more satiating and why foods that are high in fiber do make you naturally feel fuller because of this mechanical um, 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 ex explanation. Now, uh, if I might take a little interlude, ladies and gentlemen, if I might, um, have you ever considered how much heat, how much energy it takes to boil a kettle of water? Say a liter, you're going down, you're making a couple of cups of tea, okay? So you put a liter into a kettle and then you press boiling. So how much, how many calories are, are required for that? Okay, well, going back to our nomenclature, if one calorie raises one liter of water by one degree Celsius, well then surely to boil the liter of water, all we need is 100 calories. And hold that thought, that assumes that the water coming out of the tap is at zero degrees Celsius, which unless you live in Alaska is not the case. So if you, if you live most other places, it's what, 15 degrees Celsius, roughly speaking. So it all really only takes 85 calories to boil a liter of water. Are you thinking, really? Yes. Now, how much is 85 calories? Just, just okay. 85 calories is roughly, depending on if you're talking a small, medium or large egg, is roughly one average size hen's egg. You're thinking, are you serious? I am serious. So given that we eat 2,000 to 2,500 calories a day, but if we do 2,000 calories, well, that's enough to boil 20 liters of water from freezing to boiling, okay? And we only have five and a half liters of blood in us. How come our blood is not boiling when we eat 2,000 calories of food? It would if all 2,000 calories of food were lit on fire at once, but that's not what happened, right? Because after the digestion and it actually goes in, we therefore have to then digest and then metabolize the food into little poofs of energy, into little units of energy that is released as and when we actually need it, okay? And this is the process of metabolism. And these little units of energy are ATP. So for those of you who studied uh, chemistry or biology in the past, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. This is the adenosine area. The triphosphate means three phosphate groups. Look, the important part is in this phosphate groups in which it takes a lot of energy to put a phosphate group on. So when you lose that phosphate group, when ATP gets converted to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, energy gets released. And that is the usable bit of energy that we actually use and then the, and, and, and harness to, to, to do everything. And then when we metabolize our food within our, the, the mitochondria within our cells, we then use the energy to stuff a phosphate group back onto ADP, back to ATP. Now within us, I don't know if you guys know this, within us at any one point, there are five grams, roughly speaking of ATP, five grams, all right? But over a single day, each of us recycles our own body weight, 75 kilos, that's my body weight, 75 kilos of ATP. So five grams is constantly being cycled from ATP to ADP, energy. Then we eat the food that it push, 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 pushes it back on again. And this distribution of the 2000 calories of, of, of energy that we eat is then distributed over these five grams of ATP over 24 hours. And that is how we actually function. And this is the process of intermediary metabolism. I know this is biochemistry, but this is relevant, I promise you, all right? So what happens here is when we actually digest our food, protein is digested into amino acids, carbs are digested into glucose, or if you ate glucose to begin with, sugars, and fats are digested into fatty acids. This happens in the intestines. They go across the intestinal wall and into our bloodstream and then transport it. Now, those are intermediate uh, uh, metabolites, intermediate nutrients, and these nutrients are therefore destined for our, for our organs and tissues. And you can do two different things with these uh, uh, intermediary metabolites. You either store it or you burn it, okay, depending on your, your, your state of hunger. So in this process, however, you, we need to consider what these are made of. Glucose and fatty acids are relatively easy to deal with because they are only formed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, only in different configurations. So therefore, burning them or storing them is relatively energy efficient because you just reconfigure the molecules. The problem with protein is protein, in addition to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, contains a lot of nitrogen, okay? And some sulfur, but primarily nitrogen. So when suddenly you need to store 
protein. Protein, yeah, you might be thinking, well, don't you just store it as muscles? You don't, okay? All protein that we, that we use in muscles and in our cells are, are active. They're used. This is not like fat. This is not like, like glycogen. This is there to function. When you need to store it, you need to convert it into fat, okay? And the way to do that is you have to jettison the nitrogen, and that comes off as urea, okay, which you then wee out. And this costs energy. So let's now back away, all right? Now we consider, okay, wait a minute. Okay, so now we actually have to do stuff with the food that we eat. We don't just burn the food as energy. We need to do stuff. And so let's talk about the caloric availability of protein, amino acids, of carbs, and of fat. Because of this whole rigmarole that we have to go through, for every 100 calories of protein that you eat, and these are at water calories, these are the calories you put on the side of your packaging at the moment, we are only ever able to use 70, 70 calories of the protein. 30% of the, of the protein calories we eat is given off as heat, as energy to deal with protein. So just uh, uh, as a starter, all of your protein calories on the side of your packaging is 30% out. It's wrong by 30%, okay? Now, how about carbs? Now, carbs, it really depends. Are we talking about the powdered white stuff, sugar? which I already told you is 98%, which is unsurprising. But what happens in carbs in the form of um, wholemeal toast or quinoa or, or something that is high in fiber, fiber, okay? Ah, well, that's very different. Then for every 100 calories of wholemeal toast, just as an example that you're eating, our body has to spend 10 calories, okay, in, in order to deal with, 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 with it. So carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, pardon me, is 90% available okay fat is the is the odd one out because fat is so energy dense it's our it's our long term uh, long term store clearly it is also very efficient to break down fat and so we can break down fat with barely any release of heat at all for energy and so actually fat 100 calories of fat is pretty much 98 to 100% available so it's nearly it's nearly correct at water was correct about the, uh, the amount of energy we actually absorb in fat. And those are the caloric availabilities of our, of our foods, okay? And how we're actually wrong in terms, of our, in terms of our labelings. So now, if you actually then take this concept of caloric availability and begin to paste it on the, life that, the lives that we lead out, outside in, in the environment, okay, I'm going to start with popular diets. Then you begin to think, actually, Caloric availability explains how most of the diets that work actually work. I'm going to give you a, a, an example in a second. Look, so what I study, so look, this, we've all seen versions of this, of this um, um, scales of justice. This is otherwise known as the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. And um, we can't magic energy and we can't magic the energy away. The only way for people to gain weight is to eat more than they burn. Therefore, the only way to lose weight is to burn more than you eat, okay? Now, I know what you guys are thinking. Did he just say eat less and move more? I, I guess I did because it's physics, but that is the how, and that's the critical thing. Our body weight is going to be the result of physics, the how. What I study is the why. Why do people behave so differently around food? Why do some people, just as an example, respond to stress by eating and other people respond to stress by not eating. So I'm a stress eater. My wife, the moment she's stressed, work, whatever it is, she stops eating. Oh, I can't eat anything. I, I've lost my appetite. Okay. Why is that? It's the same hormone. It's cortisol. Why do some people love food? Other people not use food as fuel. Why do some people take longer to feel full? Whereas other people, you know, can feel full with very little food. Now, all of these are the, are the why we eat more, which then influences the how. And I study the, the, the variability. And in effect, just very briefly, the reason we have an issue today is because there are susceptible people out there who find it more difficult to say no, like 5%, okay, less likely to say no because of all their genes that influence the how, okay? And in the food environment that we actually live in, this permissive environment where we actually, you know, where there's Uber Eats and Deliveroo and all the foods are very, very available, we don't have to go hunting antelope, okay? So suddenly, if we feel even a little bit uh, uh, peckish or a little bit hungrier, uh, um, that we are able to go out and actually and actually get these foods, okay? And this is part of the the, the, the reason actually of the of the uh, obesity epidemic that we're living in. So in effect, 
all diets that manage to create a calorie deficit and energy deficit is a diet that works. So if you actually take every single diet out there, and I've done this, okay, and studied the mechanisms of how they work, their actual mechanisms, not what they say on the side in their website or their brochure, okay, then actually there are three key components to a diet that works, that gets you to eat less. These are going to be diets that result in caloric restriction, diets that are high in protein, and diets that are high in fiber. And these incidentally are not mutually exclusive. So you can have a mix, you can have a mix, 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 mix of both, all right? So diets that, are, uh, uh, that have to do with caloric restriction can be low calorie diets, shakes, uh, or intermittent fasting. So th these are easy to understand. They don't disguise what they're doing. They're saying eat less, okay, that's fine. But then the most popular diets don't actually do these because these are very, very A, boring and B, unpleasant. <laughs> unpleasant because people don't want to executive decision eat less typically all right but then if you start painting some backstory okay on, on onto the diets then people become become more interested so high protein diets just as an example so how high is high my understanding of the industry is i don't think there is a standard for what high protein actually means you can have protein enriched but looking at the literature for what people are, are doing for the studies we're looking at greater than 16 percent of the total energy is from is from protein okay this this is what i define as um as high protein and if you then begin to look at some of the diets out there a lot of the popular diets are now hashtag lchf low carb, high fat diets. I've listed a few of them here. And this is in order of uh, severity of carbohydrate restriction. So we start with Atkins, people have heard of before, Ducan, Southwest, Keto, Carnivore, the ridiculous carnivore diet. Okay, now you see that I'm saying these are high protein, but a protein doesn't even get mentioned in the LCHF, it's low carb, high fat. Yeah, but when you remove energy from carbohydrates, you have to replace the energy with something else. And you replace part of it in fat, but actually fats are quite, in of themselves, quite unpalatable. You don't eat a stick of butter by itself. You put it on toast, you put it on carbs. So people, if you remove the carbs, typically replace a lot of the calories with protein. These are high protein diets. And high protein diets work because why? Because proteins take longer to digest, making you feel fuller and take more energy to metabolize thus making you feel fuller, thus you're absorbing less calories. Then there are LCHF diets, but with hugely complicated backstories, such as gluten-free. I'm not going to go into this detail, guys. Celiacs, please stay away from gluten because you're, because you're allergic to gluten. There are people genuinely, 3 to 4% of the population, that are um, um, intolerant of gluten. And this can range anywhere from being slightly farty to, 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 to significant gastrointestinal distress. Stay away from gluten. But if you can digest gluten, and that's actually the majority of us, 95% of us, dude, okay, if you go gluten-free, you are in effect going low carb, therefore you're having more protein. Um, this is how it works, okay? It's not because of that gluten is bad for you if you can do gluten. And how about paleo? This is eating like a caveman. Well, there is no singular caveman. It's not Fred, this is the Fred Flintstone fantasy because whether it depended whether or not you were an Eskimo on the Greenland ice sheet or were you a hunter-gatherer in the Serengeti, you'd be eating what was available to you. So this, however, because of the Fred Flintstone fantasy, paleo diets are high in protein, which is how they actually work. All right. So how about fiber? Now, one of the things which I do is I present documentaries for the BBC, and I did, and I present for something called Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, where I was asked about the health benefits of being on a vegan diet, okay? Now, there are ethical and there are environmental reasons that people choose to be vegan, and these are entirely legitimate to talk about, right? But this is a health program, we were dealing with it, and I went plant-based. I, I didn't go vegan, which means that I ate whole grains and lentils and peas, and I didn't eat chips, Okay. And actually being plant-based was for me particularly good. I ended up losing about four kilos, 10, 11 pounds. Um, and my blood cholesterol levels actually dropped. But the question is why? Why did I lose the weight? Because the caloric availability of plant-based foods is very low. Why? Because of the presence of fiber. You have to eat a lot of lentils to match the calorie content of a steak, ladies and gentlemen. And there's only so much time in a day you can chew, right? But um, um, for that. So I lost weight because I ate less, because your body has to deal with the fiber to extract calories. So if you now take that lesson and look at high fiber diets that actually are um, out there, 
These are the low GI diets. This is the this is the uh, the orange juice versus the orange phenomenon. Okay, where it's exactly the same food, exactly the same amount of sugar, exactly the same amount of vitamin C, but one has fiber and the other one doesn't. Yet the glycemic index of orange juice, which incidentally has the same amount of sugar as Coca-Cola, just pointing out, okay, that's not any better than anything else. But because you eat it in the form of an orange and your body has to fight through the fiber in order to, um, you know, to extract the sugar, okay, you actually take a longer time to actually absorb the sugar. Plant-based, I've explained why. Mediterranean is not plant-based, but you eat lots of whole grains. And then there are, once again, with the typical uh, backstory, you have plant-based um, 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 diets with a complex backstory. Ridiculous alkaline diet, guys, nothing you eat will change the pH of your blood. Nothing, I can just guarantee you that. Um, but it works and people stick to it because people consider meat and dairy products alkaline. What this means is alkaline diet is a plant-based diet. Same for the cert food. This is the thing that Adele was on, right? She came back half the woman, but more of a woman. Really annoyed me. But anyway, leaving that aside, cert food, if you look at it, it's a very restrictive plant-based diet. So then we're going to talk about, just very briefly, I realize I'm about to, 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 to run out of time. Let's bring it all together, okay? Because obviously I'm talking about protein. I'm talking about fiber. How does this impact you, okay? Because you guys manufacture food. You make food. And a lot of your food is what people will call ultra processed foods. And at the moment, there's a lot of discussion going on about how terrible that this is the evil uh, uh, of the food industry. Okay, what is the issue ultra processed foods? Ultra processed foods are naturally because of the processing uh, that, that is required to, to produce the food is naturally lower in protein and fiber. Hence, they're very calorically available. And because they typically lack flavor, you have to add flavor back in, which comes from sugar, fat, and salt, the holy trinity, okay? So ultra-processed foods tend to be lower in protein and fiber, but higher in salt, sugar, and fat. But why does it exist? Why do ultra-processed foods exist? Because of the industrial processes, economies of scale, length of shelf life, they are cheaper, and they have played a role in keeping the 7 billion human beings on this earth alive. All right. And not only that, they are cheaper. And so a substantial percentage of the population, the people who are underprivileged, and I want to bet that any of the people on this call right now and listening to me, you are not underprivileged, you don't have food insecurity, but a lot of people do, okay, end up buying ultra processed foods because they're cheaper, because they have to need to use their precious resources in a number of different ways, and they choose to feed their, their children. How do we deal with this? Everything I've told you, okay, yes, we should cook stuff from scratch, we should do this, all, all I agree, if you're privileged enough to do so. So I guess it really annoys me when people say, please replace that chocolate bar with a banana. Guys, sometimes life demands a chocolate bar, sometimes life, sometimes life demands a banana, okay? It depends what you're looking for. The question to ask is, can you make a better chocolate bar? Can you make an ultra processed food which is higher in protein and higher and or higher in fiber, okay? Because if you do so, then if I'm in a chocolate bar mood, uh, a frozen lasagna mood, you know, a flapjack mood, then I can choose something which is gonna be higher in protein, nuts perhaps, okay? High in fiber, more dried fruits perhaps, okay? And therefore, if I'm in a chocolate mood, I still fulfill my chocolate desire, my chocolate requirement without necessarily needing to have a banana, which would not have fulfilled my chocolate requirements. So can you guys do better is, is, is my question. And I think you can. I think you can because the reformulation required, you guys, the biggest brains in food manufacturing, I can't imagine that you guys cannot figure out a way of stuffing more protein and fiber um, into the food that we actually had. So look, my last two thoughts and I'll shut the hell up. Is it true that the vast majority of non-communicable diseases are diet related? Yes, it is. This includes obesity, and their various and its various sequelae, such as uh, type two diabetes, um, a, a certain heart diseases, certain cancers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, we we we've all heard this is true. So clearly, we need to fix something about the food environment we're actually living in. But we're not going to do it through fear. Okay, I, at least I don't I don't think so. What do I mean by fear of food? Incidentally, I hope Gwyneth Paltrow is not on the call. But I, and I'm not making this up. Okay, so her her lifestyle page is encouraging achieving your leanest livable weight. This is, this, as far as I can understand, this is as skinny as you can get without dying, right? Is this, is this true? Anyway, I mentioned this at a, at a New Scientist Live um, in, uh, thing, and the media picked it up. And this is from the, the, the Independent. They pulled this up saying, Cambridge geneticists in argument with Gwyneth Paltrow. 
I don't know, Gwyneth. <laughs> but what I'm saying is we need to understand our food better, how we interact with the food. We need to love our food. For some people, we just need to eat a little bit less of food. So why don't calories count? Because crucially, and this is the crucial bit, we eat food. We do not eat calories. Okay. We, then we have to, our body extracts the calories from the food. And if you focus on health, your weight will take care of itself. So ladies and gentlemen, look, this is, this is my book. Um, um, why calories don't count. So what should we be counting in case of calories? These are my take home uh, uh, points. Three numbers I want you guys to think about. 16. And this is the sweet spot, I think, of energy we should be trying to get from protein in our diet. Not only steaks, beans, tofu, plant-based stuff, a mixture of proteins uh, uh, that, that are going to be available, 16%. Next number, 30. These are the grams of fiber we should be shooting for. On average, in the UK and North America and Western Europe, we're only reaching 15, 16 grams, maybe. We need at least 30, the more the merrier, 30 grams. Five, and this is the percentage of free sugars. This is sugars that are added, the powdered white stuff, or from honey, from algae, nectar, from maple syrup, blah, 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 as opposed to, to, to fruit, as opposed to sugar tied up in food. You want to reduce and keep free sugars to less than 5% of your daily energy intake. And finally, please consider for your health and for the environment, meat-free days. I'm not countenancing everyone necessarily going vegan. I'm not vegan, okay? But two nights a week, maybe, I eat plant-based foods. Consider meat-free days. Wow. Giles, a huge thank you from Team TFP and the 2021 Summit audience for helping us to think a little differently about the types of food we eat rather than just the, the calories, how they're made up, the calorie composition, the important role of uh, fibre and protein in that, that mix, and perhaps how we can think about calorie information in a more sophisticated way and at least starting to point us in the right direction of how we can develop better ultra processed foods. Thank you, Giles, for joining us today and really uh, thought provoking keynote. It's a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you so much, Charles.